Well, hey, everybody, good morning, and welcome to Lake Ekone Church one week after Easter. And one week after Easter means a lot of things about today. It means that you're probably not wearing your Easter outfit, I'm guessing. Um, it probably means that your afternoon meal is not going to be nearly as special as it might have been last week, but it probably means that you don't have the house guests that you had last week, so that may be a plus, uh, but it probably also means that you have not as much Easter candy at the house as you did last week, uh, probably because you ate it all. Did, did anyone imbibe in Easter candy during this week? Okay, a few of you, a few of you. The rest of you just maybe not quite as honest, or you have a whole bunch of stale peeps at your house right now. But regardless, I am so glad that you are here today, whether you were here last Sunday or if you're our guest for the very first time this week. And if we haven't met, my name is Andy. I'm on staff here, and I'm glad that you're here alongside us. And it may surprise you to know that we designed even this service with you, our guest, in mind. In fact, our guest service team has already prepared a gift for you just to say thank you for being a part of the service today. And rather than embarrassing you by trying to hand it out here in the room, that gift, they have that for you in the studio, which if you head out at the end of the service and look to your left, you'll see that studio right at the intersection of the hallways. And you can swing by quickly, grab that gift as you head out the door. It's actually something I think you will want to take with you, it's something really nice. So uh, you'll want to grab that as you head out the door. And for those of you who are our guests online, you can go to guest.lakeacone.church and we'll email you something kind of cool as well. Well, as we go through this morning, every Sunday is a celebration of the truths that we celebrated at Easter, that our Heavenly Father went out of his way to build a relationship with us, to send Jesus on our behalf as a demonstration of his love for us. And so the songs that we're going to sing this morning, they affirm the response that many of us have towards that kind of love from our Heavenly Father. So I hope that you'll join in and sing those truths alongside us as quickly as you're comfortable doing that. Uh, but for now, if you would, stand to your feet, say hey to someone near you, tell them whether you ate all the Easter candy, and we'll keep this morning going. Good morning, everybody. So glad you're here. We're going to jump in. I love this reminder of God's faithfulness. We're going to sing this first song together. Join us. Here we go. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. And your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to light, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy's wide, because you're good on your promise. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you start I've seen it in my life It's a narrow road that leads to life But I want to be on it yeah. It's a narrow road and the tide is high Cause you're part of the water yeah. I'll take you out of your world If you say Thank you. 
said I'm saved, you call me yours You said my future is full of your hope You've never failed, so I know that you never failed me You said your love would never give up You said your grace is always enough You said your heart Take me, it's good news And you said I'm saved You call me yours You said my future's full of your hope You never failed So I know that you never failed me Sing, I'll take you out of your word If you said it, I'll believe it I've seen how good if you started, you'll complete it. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I'll believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you started, you'll complete it. I'll take you at your Shall bow in humble adoration 
and they're proclaimed. My God, how great you are. Say, this sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Then how great thou art. How great thou art. But it sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Then how great thou art. My soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. And how great Thou art, how great Thou art. But then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou
up for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we love you. We thank you so much. Thank you for your presence. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus, Lord, to die and to raise again and that he is alive. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us if we call him Lord today. Lord, we love to sing to you because you are worthy. You're worthy of all of our praise. And it's an honor to sing. Lord, be glorified today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for singing. You can take your seats. So if you um, came prepared to give, there are baskets in the back where you can do that, or you can give online at give.legoconi.church. And now we are going to connect with this morning's conversation. So this week, following Easter, I was able to get away for just a couple of days, and my trip took me off some of the more beaten pathways, off the interstates, and onto some state highways. And along the way, I was so impressed by the number of churches that I saw in every community. And all of these churches, that they looked different and they felt different. And some of them were in really, really old buildings. And some of them were in really large buildings. And some of them were in storefronts. And some of them were in new construction. And some of them had amazingly cool logos and really neat names. And others, you could tell, they had been there for centuries and had a more iconic name. Some of them had uh, little uh, marquees outside with, I I guess you would call them pithy sayings on on them, Uh, but there were so many different kinds of churches. And though I don't know much about all of those churches, I think there's one thing that I could say with absolute certainty about every one of them. There are less people in the seats this morning than there were last week. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that's universally true in nearly every single church. And in fact, if statistics are true, then there's probably less people in the seats in nearly all of those churches this Sunday, a week after Easter, than there were five years ago, or 15 years ago, or maybe even 50 years ago, a week after Easter. And for those of us that are sitting at Houston Church or Lake Oconee Church or joining us online, for some of us, that idea can be bothersome. To us. In fact, for many of us who consider ourselves Jesus followers, it's concerning to us because we so believe 
in the resurrection that we celebrated last Sunday, that we want that message to cascade not only in our lifetime, but well beyond our lifetime. We're mindful that we get to steward the movement that that resurrected Jesus launched for just a brief season of time. And then we hand it off to those who come after us. And we want that message to land in their hands as clearly as it landed in ours. We want to steward that so that we hand off the local church better than where it was handed to us however long ago. And we want it to be as pivotal for our children and our students and our grandchildren as it was in our stories when we first realized that Jesus came into the world to save sinners and he proved it with his death and his resurrection. But I'm mindful that not all of us that are sitting in the rooms this morning, not all of us would consider ourselves to be Jesus followers. Some of us are are a bit skeptical about who Jesus is or what religion is. Some of us are investigating. What does it look like to trust Jesus for myself? And you've not crossed a line of faith. You're, You're still exploring what that might look like for you. But I would guess that even for you, there are elements of the story of Jesus that you wouldn't want to to go extinct. Values that would be described really as, as Jesus values. Values like honesty and kindness and forgiveness and decency. Because collectively, we looked around the world at places where those values are not held in high esteem, and we grieve that. We wish that they were, we believe that they should be, and we miss them when they're absent. And I would suggest that for all of us, there's a moment in our lives, maybe not right now, but in a moment of silence, a a moment of pondering, when every single one of us would like the story of the resurrection to be true because we all reach a point where we hope that there is more to life than just this life. But there was a time when the message of Jesus was gaining momentum, when it was covering ground, when more and more people were, were hearing and becoming engaged and, and choosing to be followers and becoming excited about that message. There was a time when the crowd moved from being just three people to 12 people and then 72 people and then 120 people following the resurrection of Jesus. And that 120 people soon became 3,000 people and then 5,000 people. And then most of the ancient world who heard and knew and many of whom believed in Jesus. And at that time, people would come to faith and they would believe in Jesus. They would become a follower of Jesus as individuals and sometimes in in pairs, sometimes as whole families, sometimes as whole communities. We might even say that the message of Jesus went viral in the ancient world. Now that idea of going viral is a term that a lot of us are familiar with because of social media, but it simply means that something that it impacts people exponentially. And because of different social media platforms, we're able to share ideas, share memes and, and, and content in different directions so that other people see it. And as it resonates with them, they share it with others. And the same at one time, was true of the message of Jesus. 
when we use that idea of viral, for a lot of us, we can remember back to the very first things that we saw that went viral, things that we watched and then we shared it with somebody else, things that we saw, maybe a meme, maybe something else that we saw and shared with somebody else. Maybe, maybe it was this video that I'm going to share with you. It was one of the first things to go viral back nearly 17 years ago. And it was not only one of the first viral videos, it currently has more than 700 million views. 700 million views. So take a look at just a snippet of this in all of its 240p glory. That was the quality. Some of you may have seen this back in its original day. This was uh, one of the first YouTube con- content creators. Uh, we won't play it for the rest of the, of the uh, service, but uh, it, it was one of the first things that went viral. Now, experts spend years trying to decipher what causes something like that to go viral. What causes it to catch on and other people to share it and share it again and share it again? But the message of Jesus was something that people shared and shared and shared again. And though we're no viral content experts, I do think that we can draw three principles from some of the truth of Scripture that help us to understand what caused the message of Jesus to spread. So we're calling this series simply viral because they wouldn't let me call it what I wanted to call it, which was how the message of Jesus spread through the then known world and how it can still. But apparently that wouldn't fit on the screen, so they said, no, we're just going to call it viral. But we're going to explore this this morning from one awkward conversation that Jesus was a part of. And this awkward conversation, uh, as Jesus was a part of it, he called out a slur that was used against him and against one of a highly esteemed other person in that day and time. And this conversation is documented by Matthew in one of the biographies that we have of Jesus' life, the gospel as we call it, of Matthew. And Matthew records the story of Jesus, and it includes this particular conversation. Now, as we set the stage for this conversation, you need to know that it includes a discussion of John the Baptizer. Now, John the Baptizer was a man who appeared on the scene shortly before Jesus, uh, but he now was in prison. And he had sent his closest followers to ask Jesus, are you the one that I was supposed to be in advance of? Are you the one that I was supposed to be highlighting that they were coming? Are you the Messiah? Are you the chosen one? Are you God with us? And in the conversation, Jesus acknowledges that John the baptizer was was a bit eccentric because unlike many of the people of that day, John the baptizer lived in the wilderness. That's where he chose to make his home. He didn't sit down at a table like the other people of that day would have, but instead he chose to eat bugs, locusts out in the desert, and he ate honey in the desert as well. And he dressed himself not in the flowing robes that were customary of that time, But instead, he dressed himself in animal skins. And yet, Jesus refers to him as the greatest prophet of all. Because from Jesus' perspective, every prophet up to that point had been a prophet highlighting that one day, the Messiah would come. But John the baptizer, he had a different responsibility. He got to highlight that that Messiah was here. 
And in fact, he directed everyone's attention and he said, here is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And it's against that backdrop that Jesus says this. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. Now, I don't know about you, but as I read this verse, I feel like I just opened up a chapter in English literature somewhere and I have no context for what's being said. But for Jesus in this moment, he's saying, I don't even know how to describe the people that I'm alongside. The best way I could think to describe it would be like a group of children who are sitting in the marketplace and one of them says, let's play a wedding song. And someone else yells, no, that's too happy. So the person says, well, let's play a funeral dirge. And the group says, no, that's too sad. Jesus is saying, there, there doesn't seem to be any way to make the people of this generation happy. And then he begins to elaborate. And he says, for John, John the baptizer, came neither eating nor drinking. Remember the, the locusts and the honey thing? He came neither eating nor drinking. And they said of him, he has a demon. Now Jesus has already acknowledged he was a bit of a weird dude. But people went a, a lot farther than that. And they said, something's wrong. In fact, we think he's possessed by Satan. That's what they thought of John. And then Jesus comes and behaves very differently than John the baptizer. Jesus says, the son of man, speaking of himself, came eating and drinking. And they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. This last phrase, if you and I were to say it, we would say something like, but the proof is in the pudding. Let's see what the outcome is. Because Jesus knew that many had responded to John the baptizer and many more would respond to him as well. But why the slurs? Why did they have to say those kind of things about John the Baptist and, and about Jesus, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Why the slurs? Because of the behaviors of John the Baptist and Jesus. In both cases, there was a slight truth. John the Baptist, he, he was a bit odd. And Jesus could often be found with the less than religious. And Matthew, the one who's recording this conversation, he knew that firsthand because it was his story. Just a few pages earlier, in Matthew chapter 9, Matthew records, as Jesus went on from there. Now, the there that he's referring to is Jesus meeting the men who lowered down their friend through the roof, and he was paralyzed on a mat. And Jesus forgave his sin, and he healed him, and told him to, to roll up his mat and get up and walk. So when Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Now, this idea of sitting at the tax collector's booth, I realize that because it's April 16th, that brings up a lot of angst in some of us. I think it's due tomorrow. But in this day and time, it brought up way more angst. 
Because when Jesus says there was a man sitting at a tax collector's booth, everyone immediately begins to think that this man is a sympathizer with the enemy. Because in that day and time, a tax collector agreed with the occupying Roman government to collect taxes on their behalf from his own people. He was sympathizing with the enemy against his own countrymen. But not only did they see him as a sympathizer, they saw him as a robber, as a thief, because he would take what he had promised to send to Rome and send that on. But he would charge more than that to his countrymen because that's how he made a living. That's how he lined his pockets. That's how he became wealthy. And that's why in this society, a tax collector was considered to be an outcast. Think of this. A tax collector in that day and time could not be a witness in a trial, could not be on the jury in a trial, and had been ex excommunicated from their local synagogue. They couldn't worship alongside the other people in their community. And not only did that apply to them, it applied to their entire family. But Jesus looks at Matthew and he says, follow me. And Matthew got up and he followed him. Now, here's what's incredible about that, because it had to create tension in Matthew. Because as Matthew walks away from this tax collecting booth, he walks away from an agreement that he had made with the Roman government. Someone else was going to step into that spot. Matthew would not have the opportunity to go back again and to take this seat. He's now destitute as he follows Jesus. Unlike the fishermen who could and did go back to fishing at times, Matthew abandoned his occupation as he began to follow Jesus. So it created some tension in Matthew, but it also had to create some tension in the other followers of Jesus as well because they were there, but now they were associating with an outcast in society. And for Peter and Andrew and James and John, they had likely encountered Matthew before and had to pay some sort of tax for the ability to fish in the Sea of Galilee. But Jesus says, follow me. And he does. And then Matthew fast forwards a few minutes, a few hours. And while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and with his disciples. In this day and time, it wasn't simply, hey, we happen to be in the same restaurant at the same hour because it was lunchtime, so we all ate together. Eating together carried with it some significant meaning. It conveyed kinship and friendship and, and goodwill. And because of that, the religious leaders of that day they were very, very careful not to eat with anyone who was not as committed to the Old Testament law as they were, both the, the written law and the oral tradition that they passed on as they elaborated on that law and made it more weighty than it had ever been before. And so... When the Pharisees saw that Jesus was eating with this multitude of tax collectors and sinners, they asked his disciples, why is your teacher doing this? Now, some of these followers, they'd only been following Jesus mere days, perhaps weeks. In Matthew's case, mere hours. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners and sinners simply referred to all the people who weren't able to be as religious as the religious class of people. But from the Pharisees' perspective, this was scandalous. Jesus was risking 
being unclean, by being with people like this. But Jesus understood. He understood that proximity forges credibility. You see, Jesus wasn't with the tax collectors and sinners so that he could behave like them, so that he could participate in their lifestyle. Jesus was with the tax collectors and the sinners because that's why he came. Jesus left the holiness of heaven and came to earth to be in proximity with humankind. Jesus understood the importance of relationship. And so he began to explain. He said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick. Jesus says, think with me for a second. It's not the people that are standing around going, he needs help. Those people don't need the doctor. The person who needs the most help is the one in the middle. The one everyone's concerned about. And Jesus said, that's why I'm here. It's for the one who needs the attention. See, Jesus didn't have much time for those who assumed they were already right. Jesus said this. He said, but for you, I want you to go and learn what this means. Now, just that phrase, go and learn, was offensive. It, it tweaked the Pharisees of that moment because that's what the rabbis would say when the student needed to study more. I want you to go and learn. And the Pharisees, who were the keeper of the law, had just been told by Jesus, you need to go study this out just a little bit more. Go and learn what this means. And then he quotes from the prophet Hosea. Hosea 6, verse 6. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You see, in the day of Hosea, there was a whole group of religious people who were very concerned about appearing to be holy. And yet at the core of their being, they were unwilling to demonstrate mercy. And so Hosea prophesies, I desire God, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So Jesus says, for you, I want you to go and learn. But for me, for me, I have not come to call the righteous or those who think they're already right or already have it right. But I've come to call the sinners. You see, Jesus purposefully spent time with the people who needed reaching, often the outcast or the marginalized in that society. So there were the tax collectors. There were the broad category of sinners. Jesus reached out to the women of that day, the financially under-resourced, those who were religious but seeking. Could Jesus be something more than just a good teacher. He reached out to those who were spiritually unqualified, the unclean. He reached out to the political opposition of that day, the the Romans that occupied Israel. He reached out to those who were racially different, the Samaritans. Because Jesus understood That if we're going to reach, if you'll throw that up for me, please. If we're going to reach people, then we have to know people. It's why he left heaven and came to earth. And as Paul reminds us, was tempted in all points like as we are. And yet, without sin. And for you and I, that's incredibly, incredibly meaningful. Because for any single one of us who have at any point in time 
felt like there was no way that God could love us. There's no way that God could forgive what I've done, what you've done. There's no way that knowing the story that God would get involved in your life. There's no way that looking at your talent level that God would call you. There's no way that God could have a place in his story for you. All of that is obliterated when we look at how Jesus intentionally came and purposefully reached out to those who were least likely to be called into the family of God. And for a lot of us, we want to walk out with that feeling of comfort and assurance and hope and meaning. And that is an incredibly good place to be because we recognize that Jesus was a friend of sinners. Sinners like me. And like you. But in the last few pages of the book of John, as John is documenting Jesus' life, following Jesus' resurrection, he records a conversation where Jesus looks at his followers then and he gives them an instruction that would cascade to them and to those that they influenced and those that they influenced all the way down to those of us who today would call ourselves Jesus followers. And Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so now I am sending you. So if Jesus came understanding that in order to reach people, you have to spend time and know people, then there is an expectation on our lives for those of us who would consider ourselves to be Jesus followers, that we too have an opportunity to get to know people. People that might self-describe as being far from God though they might be close to us. And so this statement becomes very personal. If we're going to reach people, then we, you and me, we have to know people. To which, honestly, most of us, our minds begin to race and we think things like, okay, great, so when am I going to do that? When am I going to do that? Have you seen my schedule? Because once I walk out of here, I've got things booked all afternoon. I have things that start tomorrow. I have calls. I have Zoom meetings. I have appointments. I have people I've committed to spend time with. I've got things that I'm doing for fun. I've been looking forward to for days. I'm going to be a part of several things. I've got my family. I've got people in my life that are counting on me. When am I going to fit some sort of religious obligation into my life? When am I going to do that? And what's more, for a lot of us, for those of us who have been Jesus followers for more than a few years, let's say, we may be asking a different question. Not only when, but but where do I find people? Where do I find people who don't share a faith like my faith? Because... I've built relationships and I'm on a volunteer team and I know a bunch of Jesus followers there and I'm in a small group and I know a bunch of Jesus followers there and, and you know I know the people that I sit alongside and most of them are Jesus followers. So I'm not sure where I would get to know people who aren't trying to follow Jesus like I'm trying to follow Jesus. And for the record, if you've ever wondered why our church doesn't have events scheduled on Monday night and it's something different on Tuesday night and something different on Wednesday or Thursday. It's for this very reason. Because we want to allow margin in our lives where we can build relationships with people who maybe aren't thinking the same way that we are, don't share the same faith that we do and may not know the story of the resurrection in the way that it's impacted some of our lives. 
So how do we live this out? Because most of us would agree, if we're going to reach people, we have to know people. But how do we make that possible? I think there's a couple of ideas that work together. First, we have to go out of our way. We have to go out of our way. And the reason that we have to go out of our way is because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. The Apostle Paul, who at one time was one of the prestigious religious leaders. But once he figured out who Jesus truly was, he encountered him and allowed his life to be changed by the realization of who Jesus was. He spent the remainder of his life processing for those who were not Jewish people, the Gentiles, what it meant to live out the teaching of Jesus. And much of the second half of our Bible, the New Testament, contains letters that he wrote to various groups of Jesus followers who were just getting started in their faith. And he wrote to a group that were in Galatia. And he described Jesus going out of his way. And he said, at just the right time, God sent Jesus. And then he describes the way that he was born and the way that he lived his life for the sole purpose of reaching the people that he was called to. For you and I, in order to build a relationship with people, in order to get to know people, we have to go out of our way. But we go out of our way to see in our day-to-day situations, to see in our daily situations. See, Paul, as he wrote to the Colossian believers, he phrased it like this. He said, I want you to be wise in the way that you act towards what he termed outsiders, simply people who didn't understand who Jesus had come to be, people who didn't believe in the resurrection, people who didn't know the truth that God loved them and sent Jesus for them. I want you to be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. That means that for you and I, we've got to go out of our way to see in our daily situations, whether we're at work or whether we're at a restaurant, whether we're on the ball field with our children or our grandchildren, to look at every life situation differently. To go out of our way, to see in our daily situations where you can forge relationships. Paul, again, to the Corinthian believers, he phrased it like this. He said, I have made myself a slave or a servant so that I can win as many people to Jesus as possible. I'm going to go so far out of my way as to do whatever I can so that the most people possible will come to know and understand who Jesus is. Now, that phrasing from Paul, to win as many as possible, that can sound really awkward, like like somehow that that there was a, a goal to be achieved or a prize to be won. But Paul understood that people are not projects. And yet, at the same time, You and I, we get this because we are raving fans about certain things in our lives, certain products, certain services, certain things that we've experienced, that we've bought into, and we think everybody should do it that way because it changed everything for us. And in that moment, we simply want everyone else around us to experience it too, whether it's a kind of car or a restaurant that we love to eat at or a certain kind of product, we simply want others to experience what has been so pivotal for us. And that's what Paul encourages us to consider. How do we go out of our way to see in our daily situations 
where we can forge relationships. And relationships like that, they happen when we do two things. They happen when we get to know someone else's story. When you get to know why they are the way they are, what happened in their life that they would consider significant and pivotal? What is a part of their journey that's brought them to where they are? Get to know their story. And secondly, learn someone else's logic. Know someone else's story and learn someone else's logic. Most of the people you meet are not strange. They just think differently than you do. But there's a reason for that. And to them, that reason makes a ton of sense. And as you get to learn their logic, you understand where they're coming from. And that's how we're able to build a relationship. It's what the Apostle Paul did in the message from last Sunday. As Paul encountered the people in Athens and he began to understand why they had a tomb to the unknown God. And he was able to relate to them through their logic. Know someone else's story and learn someone else's logic. Go out of your way to see in your daily situations where you can forge relationships. This requires a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift that says, not I am here to live my most highly enjoyable, deeply fulfilling life for as as long as I have it here, but instead says, I am here to be an ambassador for the greatest leader ever. One who died and rose again and promises an even better eternity than any of my current options for my present life might offer. This is what Jesus did for you and I. And this is why Jesus leaves us here even after we begin to follow him. If we're going to reach people, we have to know people. And most of us are here today because someone befriended us. Someone invited us. Someone invested in us. And I would venture to say that your life has never been the same. Your future will never be the same. And your hope will never be the same. And that is the opportunity that you have and I have to provide that gift to someone else. But it only happens when we're intentional about lovingly knowing people. Perhaps people not like us. Perhaps people not alongside us. But only then will the message of Jesus continue to be viral. Now, there's two more pieces to this conversation that I don't want you to miss. So I want to invite you to come back and be a part of the conversation next Sunday as we dive in a little bit further. But for now, would you take a minute to pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus out of his way to build a bridge to each of us. God, thank you for his death and resurrection. Thank you that we can celebrate it. But God, I pray that it will be so pivotal in our lives that we, in imitation of your great love for us, will go out of our way to build intentional, loving relationships with people that you love people that you sent Jesus 
to die for. And in that way, may we give you honor and glory and a lifetime of thank you. And it's in the name of Jesus, our resurrected Savior, that we pray. Well, as we wrap up today, for those of you who are our guests, I'm so glad that that you have jumped in alongside us. And don't forget, as you leave, as you head out the door, swing to the left and go to the studio and grab the gift that's waiting there for you. And again, thank you for being here today. And for all of us, I want to invite you to come back next Sunday as we dive into part two of this conversation. And during the course of this week, look through that lens God, who have you put me alongside? Maybe somebody that you can build a relationship with. Maybe somebody that you'll invite to come sit with you as we dive into part two next Sunday. But until then, I hope that you have a wonderful week and uh, thanks for being here. Take care.